Hey guys. Uh, okay, now that we've done chemical reactions and Jupe's free energy to figure out if a reaction is exergonic or endergonic, spontaneous or non-spontaneous, kind of wanted to touch on energy transfer within an ecosystem or a habitat. So we're going to talk about food chains, food webs, and kind of this rule. It's called the 10% rule. So if you want to flip to your next page, uh, we can title it trophic structure. This one might take a couple pages. Once again, I'm going to do everything on the right hand side just because it's easier for me. But if you want to keep doing all your diagrams with us on the left, um, go for it. Your ENs are kind of yours. So make sure that you're keeping them pretty and organized. So when we talk about trophic, trophic structure, trophic levels, what we're referring to is referring to feeding and eating within an ecosystem. So the trophic structure is the feeding structure or the feeding relationships. Who is eating whom between organisms in the same habitat? So when we're figuring out like which organisms are eating which organisms, we're then determining which trophic level do those organisms belong to. So you've probably all seen a food chain. So just to review, a food chain is a linear chain showing the uh, feeding relationships between organisms. So essentially what food chains show is they're not showing necessarily the transfer of just macromolecules, so just matter. They're also showing the transfer of energy, and that's what we're going to focus on. So a food chain is representing the transfer of food energy up the trophic levels. So from your lowest trophic level to your highest trophic level, also known as your top predator. Um, humans are the top predators for a lot of food chains simply because uh, we exploit a lot of uh, of these food chains for human consumption. And then also we cause things like uh, pollution and global warming, which also kind of throws these food chains off due to human impact. So let's just start with an example. So every food chain starts with an autotroph. Every single food chain starts with an autotroph. So we're going to just write autotroph here. It could be a photo autotroph, it could be a chemo autotroph, but because it's the beginning of the food chain and we're talking about the transfer of food, the first organism needs to be an organism that creates organic mo molecules, it's macromolecules, from other inorganic sources so that it doesn't need to consume organic molecules to create organic molecules. It can use things like carbon dioxide um, and then light as an energy source. So these guys are quote unquote making their own organic molecules from inorganic molecules. So you can draw any plant. Um, I'm just going to draw a happy little tree. Shout out Bob Ross. Okay. So we start with our autotroph. Um, my tree looks like broccoli. Okay, it's broccoli. Yay. Um, these are also known as our primary, denoted as one with its uh, degree. So primary producers. So we call all of our autotrophs, our photosynthetic organisms, our chemo autotrophs producers, because they are the ones that are harnessing light energy and producing chemical energy for us. So we start with some autotroph. It's going to be a plant for here. But keep in mind that all energy that enters the food chain started with sunlight. Okay, so it's all entering the food chain through sun. Or it could be chemical energy if we have a chemo autotroph. But we need some input of energy that's going to get incorporated into the organic molecules of our organism. Now if we think of something that kind of feeds on plant life... Um, I'm going to draw a happy little caterpillar. I'm going to draw like a squiggle. Cute. Leg, 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 leg. Smile. Eyeball. So then we can have these caterpillars or these other organisms that consume our primary producers. And they're now known as our primary consumers. 
So the organisms that feed on our producers, we call them our primary consumers. They can be carnivores, sorry, not carnivores. They can be um, omnivores um, or they can uh, survive purely on plant-based food like vegetarians. Um, why can't I think of that word right now? Carnivore, omnivore. Yeah, I can't think of it. Um, but they will only eat plant-based material. It'll come to me at some point. All right, so those are our primary consumers. And then organisms that consume our primary consumers, like let's say this guy gets eaten by a cute little mouse. Wow, my size proportions are gonna be real off today. Little nose, smile, eyeball. So the mouse will eat foot, 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 foot. The caterpillar, now we're just transferring energy. So if you look at the arrows, the arrows are very important because the arrows are showing the movement of energy. So energy started here at the sun. It was radiated as light energy. It was transformed into chemical energy stored in organic molecules. And then it was consumed. Same thing, chemical energy just stored in different organic molecules. Same thing, chemical energy just stored now in mouse organic molecules. And then if we can think of an organism, oh wait. So organisms that eat our primary consumers, those are our secondary consumers. Hopefully you're catching on to the pattern. It'll just go on and on and on. So if you can think of something that would eat a mouse, like Miss G's favorite animal, Cute little kitty cat. Oh, we're gonna have a small head on this kitty cat. Right? Wow, this cat looks great. Um, so a cat would eat the mouse. We have a transfer of energy again, and this would be known as our tertiary consumer. And it can keep going. Most food chains only have about five links or less. So like one more than this. So if something eats cats, so we could put like a coyote here, that would be like a typical food chain. There's not really anything sustainable more than like seven links in a chain. Cool. Um, and then the last kind of component of every food chain would be our uh, decomposers. So we have producers, we have consumers, but we also have decomposers. And what decomposers do is they get their energy from breaking down dead organic material known as detritus. So if any of these organisms die, they will be broken down by our decomposers. So there can kind of be an arrow going from all of our trophic levels, if they die, their organic material decays because it gets broken down by decomposers, most namely bacteria, but also fungi can break stuff down. And then the decomposers are taking in some of that energy, but also transferring that energy back to our environment in the form of heat or thermal energy. Very nice. Uh, next, so we had food chains, a food web. So the only difference between a food chain and a food web is that a food web is just many food chains placed together. So instead of just showing a caterpillar and a mouse and a cat, we would show all the organisms that are consuming this plant material. So we would show like aphids and ants and bees and stuff like that. And then we'd show all the primary consumers, all the secondary consumers, etc. So a food web is simply many food chains that are linked together, showing the feeding patterns. Okay, they tend to be like really, really disorganized just because they're showing like the true um, interactions of all the organisms in the habitat. And what ends up usually happening is that an organism ends up belonging to multiple trophic levels. Because if you have an organism that's an omnivore, so something like a human, we would not only eat, imagine that this is not a caterpillar, but like a cow, right? So if this is a human and this is a cow, we would be eating the cows, which makes us a secondary consumer, but we also eat plant material, which is a primary producer. So. When you look at a food web, 
the trophic levels get blurry because organisms can belong to multiple trophic levels because it's showing all the eating patterns instead of just a single linear eating pattern. Very nice. Um, I'm going to go to the next page just because I'm not, I don't have a ton of space. But if you remember what I said earlier, food chains only get about five links long. Like most food chains in the real world, they only go about five organisms long. And there's a big reason for that. And it's called the 10% rule. So let's just call this a uh, food chain link limit. Okay, so most real food chains um, are only consist of five or fewer links. So most, not all, just most. So five or fewer or less links. And a link in the chain is just an organism. So when we drew this food chain over here, one, two, three, four, five, we drew five links in the chain. So this is a typical food chain in natural habitats. And the reason is there's this really important rule and it's called the 10% rule. Um, and it's, it's about energy transfer. Ten percent rule. So if you remember here when I said when we draw an arrow, we're showing energy. So energy starts at the sun. The energy is transferred and transformed to our autotrophs. It's transferred to the consumer, transferred to the consumer, transferred to the consumer, transferred to the decomposer. So we're moving energy from one organism to the next by consuming. Okay. The thing is only about 10% of that energy actually gets incorporated into the next organism. So let's write our rule down. Whoa, Jiggles, I'm sorry. Um, only, and it's an approximation, so approximately 10% of the energy is stored in the next organism. Or trophic level. Okay. So for example, if I had a hundred joules of energy come into this autotroph, so this autotroph um, is going to only store 10% of that. So if a hundred joules of energy was available, the autotroph would only store 10 joules of energy. The rest of that energy gets lost as heat to our environment. If this autotroph is consumed by this consumer, only 10% of the energy gets transferred. So if we started with 100 joules, then only 10 joules get stored here. That means only one joule gets stored here, and then 0.1 joule, and then 0.01 joule, and then 0.001 joules, right? But you can see decomposers can kind of consume everything, so they can get different amounts of energy depending on what organism they are decomposing. So when we draw this rule, we draw it as an energy pyramid. So we're going to draw a pyramid. You're going to start with your base. It's going to look like this. And what each layer of the pyramid represents is it represents a trophic level. So we're going to have four. So you're going to draw this one a bit smaller and then smaller, and then smallest. I'm trying to make them even, mine's a little weird. So this first trophic level is representing the amount of energy in our first link in our chain. So these would be our primary producers. So I'm just gonna write primary here. And then the next trophic level are the organisms that consume them, so that'd be our secondary, Sorry, that's wrong, our primary consumers. So we have our primary producers, primary consumers, and then we have our secondary consumers, and then our tertiary consumers. So you're just showing the amount of energy stored in each of the organisms. So let's say one million joules of sunlight, one million. Um, is coming into this habitat. 
So remember, sunlight is always our source of all energy. So a million joules um, are, of sunlight is exposed to our primary producers. The 10% rule states that the primary producers will only store 10% of that. So they will store 10,000 joules of energy that came from that sunlight. 100,000. Wait. Yep, that's right. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Una más. There we go. So 10% gets stored. So that means when these primary producers were running photosynthesis of the energy that was used, only 10% of it will stay in the plants and stored in their organic molecules, in their macromolecules. The rest of that energy, so that 90%, either gets used for locomotion, um, development, stuff like that, and then the rest of it will dissipate as heat energy back into our environment. So we're constantly losing a bunch of energy as heat. So this transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next is a really inefficient um, transfer of energy because only 10% is transferring on. So then to our next level, you would get 10,000 joules. So 10% would move on and get stored. Our next level would get 1,000 joules. Only 10% would move on. Our last level would have 100 joules. Only 10% moves on. All that extra is either used, so it's transformed into like kinetic energy for movement, which then will get dissipated as heat um, back into our environment. So we're kind of constantly dissipating our excess energy, not excess, but um, most of our energy is heat back into the environment. But this is what makes us warm. And we talked about this the other day, like we store 10% of it, but because we're constantly releasing this heat, it keeps us warm, okay? This is why in a habitat, you have a lot more producers in that habitat versus tertiary consumers. So we can even convert this into biomass. So if I have 10, 100,000 kilograms of plants, that can only support 100 kilograms of tertiary consumers because only 10% of their energy is passed on. So if you think of a habitat that you know of and like the amount of trees or grass or kelp there is versus the amount of sharks or bears there are, there's a lot fewer of our tertiary carnivores or consumers because they don't get a lot of energy and our primary producers can't support that many tertiary consumers. So that kind of puts a limit on the length of our food chains. If they get any longer, these top predators won't have enough energy to sustain their life because the habitat can't support it. Cool. Um, kind of last thing that would put a limit on our food chain. So we can kind of limit the energy that's transferred from one to the next. So 10% gets stored. The rest is lost as heat. The second thing that limits our food chain length is the, just the stability of our consumers. And it's called dynamic stability. The organisms that are the most susceptible to extinction are the ones that are higher up on the food chain. So if I have some environmental impact that starts killing my primary producers, they're gonna decrease in population size, but as that effect kind of rolls up our trophic levels, it gets amplified once it gets to our tertiary consumers because we're impacting each level as we go. Our top predators, our top consumers are kind of getting hit the worst. And so those are the ones we start to see going extinct or endangered first. So um, a more f uh, dynamic, sorry, a more stable food chain is a shorter chain. The shorter a chain is, the easier it is for our top predators to recover from any environmental stresses. If you have a longer food chain, it takes more time for your top predators to recover once the environmental stress is taken away. So the shorter the food chain is, the faster there is re for recovery for our top predators. So let's just put that into words. So 
are longer food chains. So ones that have like seven, eight, more than that links are less stable. So they're um, harder to maintain because of the support that all the primary producers have to provide for the entire food chain. So we want shorter food chains. They are more stable, they're easier to maintain, and they're easier to provide energy to every organism so that they can survive. So we have shorter food chains, those are more stable. Okay, and that reason is, if there was some environmental stress that caused our primary consumers to die, so if these guys decreased in numbers, population size, that would cause our secondary consumers to also decrease in numbers, which would cause our tertiary consumers to decrease in numbers, simply due to food availability. If our caterpillars die, then our consumers will die because they don't have a food source. What happens is when the environmental stress is gone, that will cause these guys to have flourished in that time. So you're gonna have a lot more autotrophs than you would have if you didn't have the environmental stress. So pretty quickly you'll start to see, so the environmental stress is gone, but you'll see our primary consumers shoot up, our secondaries will shoot back up, and our tertiaries will shoot back up, right? So you'll start to see it happen in a cause and effect. So they won't all increase at the same time. It's going to be a wave effect. So the consumers will first pop up. That will cause our consumers to increase in size, right? There'll be a little decrease here because they're eating them. And then that will cause our tertiaries to rise up. If we had more links in this chain, so if this cat was like the eighth organism in this chain, it would take more time for those organisms to recover from this environmental stress simply because it's going to take time for each of our trophic levels to start increasing in their population size again. And that time it takes is what causes organisms to go extinct because if it takes too long, then those organisms just keep dying and then we lose a species or a whole population due to extinction. Okay. So let's just put that into words. So dynamic stability, um, it simply allows the top predators, so our tertiary quaternary consumers, to recover faster from environmental setbacks. And a lot of those setbacks can be natural. So it could be natural disasters like fires or earthquakes that are disrupting habitats. But a lot of them currently are human impact. So pollution um, of the water and of the air, us building like and industrializing areas. So we're taking habitats away, um, acidification of oceans, all of that. So the shorter the food chains are the more stable they are simply because they can recover from these setbacks faster all right um that's it for food chains and food webs uh, if you have any questions please pop up in office hours let me know um anything you need please if i can help in any way please 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 let me know all right i'll talk to you guys later bye